the best of the week on Relevant Radio. Their courage will astound you. Their stories will move you. Their faith will inspire you. Welcome to Great Stories About Great Saints on Relevant Radio and the Relevant Radio app. Welcome to the Kale Clark Show on November the 1st, 2023. It's All Saints Day, and you know what that means. All day long on Relevant Radio today, it's great stories about great saints. And I've got a great guest, a fantastic guest to join me today to talk about one of your favorite saints, no doubt, and mine too, and certainly his. My guest today is a great friend of the program. He's the Archbishop Emeritus of Toronto, Cardinal Thomas Collins, Your Eminence, thank you so much for taking the time to come back again on the Kale Clark Show for All Saints Day. It's such a momentous day, and Colonel Collins, let's talk about somebody who was a key figure in history, certainly in the history of the Church, St. Thomas More. And I know he's a personal hero of yours, and one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on to talk about him is because I've heard you speak so eloquently and passionately about him in the past. Maybe we should go back and just sketch for our listeners what is the historical context of his life? He grew up at the time of the early 1500s. He was born in the late 1400s and grew up in the and grew up in the uh, first part of the 1500s in England. Uh, he was from London and he grew up there, and he uh, was uh, became a lawyer. He had thought of possibly becoming a priest. In fact, he I think he had thought of becoming a, a monk of the. the the greatest of all the orders in many ways, the most uh, profound, the Carthusians. Um, they uh, they live a life of mm. great strictness, and they have a place called they have a place called Charter Houses in English, the Carthusian place. And he lived at one. He lived as a kind of a boarding student there when he was studying law. So with the holy monks of the of the Charter House, he prayed and he he uh, lived with them, lived a life of prayer while he was a law student. But he decided it wasn't his vocation. His vocation mm-hmm. was to be married, and it wasn't to be a monk, although he had a great love for them. In fact, the Carthusians were among the first to be massacred, martyred uh, by Henry VIII later on, a very, just a little bit before, when Thomas was in the dungeon in the Tower of London. He could look out and see the holy Carthusian monks, probably many of whom were, had been his spiritual fathers, uh, being led to their own execution because mm-hmm. they would not give in to the to the dictator king. But then he went on, and he was very, very good, very smart, very wise, and uh, a great leader. And so he, he married, was a, a very good father. Uh, the ones who saw through Henry VIII uh, were the holy people, and had the courage to do it, to speak up. And also learned people who could mm-hmm. kind of cut to pieces his phony argumentation, you know, and say, wait, that's not right. And that's why uh, the, the Man for All Seasons is a wonderful, wonderful movie. It gives uh, a great view of that time. You're going to get a historic sense of the time of, Hen- of Henry VIII and Thomas More. But on one point, and the most important point of all, it's wrong. It's because wrong. Because the most important point of all that's always talked about with about Thomas More is conscience. Mm-hmm. He died because of his conscience. He would not sign the oath which would declare the king basically to be the head of the church, essentially. And so, and because he could not in good conscience do it. He didn't think it was right. And in the movie, in the movie and the play by Robert Bolt, who was an atheist, basically, but he, was, he, had, he admired this conscience of Thomas More. And at one point, Thomas is said to say, which he never would have said, when Norfolk, the Duke, says, uh, why don't you just sign the oath like all the rest of us? And he says, I, I do not wish to do so, or more that I cannot do that. Like, it's my mm. ego, my my inner fortress of my <clears throat> autonomous self will not give in and sign the oath. That is the precise attitude of Henry VIII, not of Thomas More. Mm. No, it was because he had studied the matter. And conscience means with knowledge. It's not just what you feel like. It is he had thought it through, and he could see flying on the two wings, as Pope John Paul II, of mm. faith and reason. He could see that the king was wrong to do this. He king wasn't the head of the church. He had no right to be so uh, cruel to his beloved, uh, dear, and faithful wife, uh, Catherine. And so his conscience was based upon thinking it through 
in the light of faith, faith and reason. It wasn't just my conscience or this or that. So it's unfortunate because the movie is spectacular, but they, but the the writer on that one most important point got it backwards. He has Thomas More giving Henry VIII's view of conscience, which is basically my conscience says I can get rid of my wife and I can because I want to do it, and that is just no, 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 no. It's also not the view of John Henry Newman, uh, who is a great, uh, great, great, uh, wonderful saint who wrote the most recent, modern, great things on conscience. Mm-hmm. And often people say, you know, as, as Newman said, conscience must be supreme. Well, he certainly did. He said it's the aboriginal vicar of Christ deep within us. But it isn't so that you think about stuff a bit and then you do what you want. It's you follow the will of God according to faith and reason. Anyway, it's, it's a big issue these days, especially in the Catholic Church. Oh, there, Because no... people sometimes say, well, just follow your conscience. Just do what, think about, think, 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 think. Okay, pray, pray, pray. Okay, now I'll do what I want. <laughs> and uh, I find that to be uh, utterly foolish and just not, doesn't make any sense. It's very interesting when you talk about uh, the conscience of Moore. He could not sign the oath of supremacy, declaring Henry VIII to be the head of the church in England. Of course, he would not do that. And, and it's interesting because today we're, we're talking here on November the 1st, All Saints Day. Yesterday, of course, Halloween, it's also the day that is celebrated by Protestants as Martin Luther making that break from the Catholic Church. Yes, and yeah. so it's very ironic that we're talking about this today, or perhaps providential. And the interesting thing about this, too, is that before Henry defected, after Luther initially made his move, and, and I think probably Thomas More, if he didn't write it himself, he certainly had a huge hand in it. Henry oh, had yeah, written... the defense of the seven sacraments. Yeah. yeah, talk to us about this. Oh, yeah, no, it, Martin Luther, of course, has the exact opposite view to Thomas More. His famous thing is, here, I stand, mm. I can do no other. He was working from I. And I always joke about Henry VIII, so was he. That's why his, his number is Henry the V, I, I, I. <laughs> for that matter, Edward VIII, the guy Love who it. put his own views above those of the, uh, of the duty. And you ever see the movie, The King's Speech? You know, this kind of playboy yeah. prince, uh, uh, he goes off with Wallace Simpson. Mm-hmm. And in his famous uh, farewell, we, everyone said, oh, he thought he gave up the throne for the woman he loved. But if you listen to the actual recording of what he said, he said, I cannot f- fulfill my duty as king as I would wish to do so without mm-hmm. the help and support of the woman I love. So that whole idea is, I think, disastrous. It turns us into little islands of, of self. And, it, and it's, I think it is really not a good move. I think it's out of touch with the whole most fundamental reality, which is the relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Blessed Trinity, of which we are made in the image of likeness. So I think it's, it's not good. So he wrote that. Uh, I mean, he said he didn't write that. I mean, he, he, gave, he was a sort of a ghostwriter for the king. The king, however, <laughs> was no a slouch when it came to theology. It's quite likely that Thomas said, no, the king wrote that book. I helped them out in a few points. That may well have been pretty true because hmm. Henry was a very was a pretty learned guy. For his defense of the seven sacraments, uh, Henry VIII was given the title of defender of the faith by the Pope. I think it's a wise move for popes not to give people titles till they're safely dead. Because <laughs> you still you still the kings the kings of England or the kings they still use the term defender of the faith, but it's, they switched faith. I mean, he switched. <laughs> having said he would defend the faith. Oh, uh... I guess that Henry thought, well, I think I'll have one of my own. So he kind of made himself into, I mean, why accept an honor from the Pope when you can become your own Pope? He created his own church. And in a sense, when he did that through the uh, the act, uh, you know, by which he set it up mm-hmm. and became the head of the church, you could say the church, comma, in England, mm-hmm. became the church of England. And there mm-hmm. is an immense difference between Big the difference. in and the of. And I think it is, I don't think it was a good move, obviously. I did want to ask you about Thomas More, both as a friend, because he's a great model of friendship, and also his witticisms, he, Thomas More is humorist. He's one of the greatest wits of all time, really. Oh, yeah, that's true. In fact, there's a very good book, uh, well, somebody in his time wrote about him. He was born for friendship. And that's the mm. title of a book by, I forget who, but the thing, a biography of him called Born for Friendship. He had many friends. He had obviously his dear friend John Fisher, the, the Holy Bishop, but also Erasmus, the uh, humanist and 
like in a day, but did not what humanism means now, which was the atheist. It was more a very, he was a very faithful Catholic humanist, but very much involved in learning and things like that. He had friends in the aristocracy. He had friends among the rich and the poor. Uh, he was a very, he, he led a joyful life in his family home at Chelsea. And you get a bit of sense of that in the movie, A Man for All Seasons. But he was really, you know, he did different things. When he was said to have, when he, when he was going up, it, he had a little trouble getting up to the scaffold. We are going to chop his head off. <laughs> and he said, well, can you help me up uh, on the way up? On the way down, I'll take care of myself. <laughs> and then as he put his, he put his head on the block. He moved his beard out of the way. He said, I better move this out. It, it didn't uh, commit any treason. And he said, you better watch out. I got a very short neck. And so he was doing this kind of stuff. And they didn't know what to make of it because he uh, he was just, uh, uh, really? he, like, he, had a, he, he and John Fisher too, unlike the others, their heart mm-hmm. was at peace because he spent every Friday in deep prayer, whole, the whole day in his little chapel he built in his, his place at uh, Chelsea. And he, he was meditating upon the reality of, of life and of death. And so he said that when he threw him in the dungeon, in which they did, they threw him and they took away even his books. Like he was a, a man who loves his books. They took them away just to punish him. But he said, you know, I'm as close to heaven here as I am in my home. So, well, you know, there's no great difference. <laughs> like the other, another great saint, uh, blessed of the 20th century, Clemens von Gallen, the Bishop of Munster in the time of Hitler, you know, he and and, was, and John Fisher, they, they could not be bullied and they could not be bribed because they were at peace with God. And that yeah. could be said of any of us. We're not famous like them. But, I mean, it's good to be in a position where we know what's really important. Spend time every day in prayer, be in touch with the Lord, and think clearly about what God wills. If someone were to ask you, what is the great lesson of Thomas More for our time, what would you say? I think the key, like there are a lot of beautiful things about him, but I think the thing is he thought deeply and he, he flew to God on the wings of faith and reason. That's what we need to do as well. That's the image from the John Paul II uses. We, we need to think clearly. Natural thinking, natural reason is very good, but also see illuminated by the, the, the life of faith. So we need to reason carefully as he did. Like he thought it through. And even in conscience, it's faith and reason. So we need to do that. We need to cut through some of the uh, just things in our society. I mean, you can't make it up. You just can't make it up. Suffer. You know, there's a point where like Hans Christian Andersen has, you know, the emperor is marching along with no clothes on and everything because some con men have uh, pretended they're tailors and, you know, the whole story of them, the emperor has no clothes. And everyone else is saying, oh, what a beautiful sort of uh, outfit he has because they're (laughs) all afraid of public opinion. But a little child says the emperor has no clothes. And so I think we, somebody like some of the things they're taken as you have to say this stuff, you have to believe it, or you are out of a job. I mean, stuff that is against reason, against common sense. We can use our minds to change the very fundamentals of who we are as men and women and stuff like that. Mm. It's like we kind of willing it so makes it so. Well, that just doesn't happen. It's not, it's, it's not, not anything that, so much theological, although it is there stuff about in the Bible, it just doesn't make sense. And yet, if you say something very sensible and just obvious that any kid should know, you can really be facing trouble in your life. So Thomas More could cut through all that stuff, could see it. He could say, no, look, what is real? What is not real? And I think that maybe is the biggest thing of all. We live in a world of illusion, in a, in a house of mirrors, smoke and mirrors, we have to be able to see what is real and what is not. He could see what was real, and that led him through the terrible problems he faced in his world, and we have to as well. That is a beautiful way to end our discussion, Cardinal Collins, on St. Thomas More. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me on the Kale Clark Show. But before we go, can you give your blessing to our listeners over the airwaves? Most well, certainly may the Lord bless all who are participating with us here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your Eminence, thank you so much for being here with us today on All Saints Day. God bless you, and all of our listeners will be praying for you in your ministry as you continue on with priest retreats and everything else you've got going, moving your books, and uh, we thank you so much and hope to talk to you soon. Thanks, Kale. It's great to be on your program. Like what you've just heard? Share it with your family and friends, and thanks for listening.